welcome to Roadside Florida, the program that takes you back in time to those Florida roadside attractions visited by tourists and locals alike. I'm Renee Ramos, director of the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives. My co-pilot on this trip is historian and history educator Sylvia Gorinsky. We begin our journey at the Miami River, the birthplace of the Magic City. Back when the Everglades reached Northwest 27th Avenue, Musa Isle was an Indian village that was more than a trading post. It was a place to see Seminoles wrestle alligators, weave clothing, and make kunti bread. Let's take a look. With the increasing importance of Florida as a tourist destination during the early 1900s, the Seminole Indians attracted curiosity. Along the Miami River, several stops highlighting the Seminoles were created. The most popular was Musa Isle. Musa Isle had its origins through farmer C.O. Richardson, who began by selling produce and jams there. In 1907, he sold the land to John Roop, who began the tourist attraction more than a decade later. Visitors could buy arts and crafts, pose for photos with the Seminoles and watch alligator wrestling. The Seminole men who did this would flip the gators, but would generally show how to hunt them for food. Similar attractions, such as Coppinger's Tropical Gardens and Tropical Hobbyland, had fierce competitions with Musa Isle for visitors, right down to the food and drinks they served. While Musa Isle was run by whites, it represented the first entrepreneurial efforts by the Seminoles. It was open until 1964. Now to elaborate more on Musa Isle, here's Sylvia Gorinsky. Welcome, Sylvia. Thank you. So could you tell us a little more about this? This seems so exotic and so unusual when you consider what's actually at that location in Miami now. Could you tell us a little bit more about Musa Isle? Well, um, the Seminole Indians were always a curiosity during the 20th century to people who came down here to visit. And there were actually a number of tourist attractions that were set up in that same general area. But uh, Musa Isle, uh, which started uh, basically as a produce stand, uh, gained the affection of everybody, I guess because of uh, how elaborate it was. It really was the, f the uh, one tourist attraction that really did put a spotlight on the Seminoles what they did, the crafts they made, the food they made. And people got a chance to see them, to take their photographs with them. And even what's known as the alligator wrestling, people were curious about that. And for the Seminoles who participated, they had a chance to show exactly how they hunted uh, alligators for food or, or other things. Now, my understanding is you could take a cruise starting at the Bayfront park area, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, and mm -hmm. then just chug down the river in just right. a very, very short way, actually. Right. And then there you were. Right. And uh, the area, it's, about, uh, it's about a couple of miles in, I guess, if you're taking the Miami River. But yeah, people could go from starting with uh, when Flagler had his Royal Palm Hotel in downtown Miami. And then uh, the 1920s, the hotels that were built there, people going from the uh, Everglades or the McAllister or the Columbus and heading up the Miami River. I think of uh, uh, Paul George's Miami River tours and uh, kind of uh, pays, pays a salute to that. Absolutely. <laughs> and it was uh, ran until what year? Or was the last year of Musa Isle? 1964. By then, the area was starting to change considerably. Uh, expressway expansion, the Dolphin, what we now know as the Dolphin Expressway was being planned. Okay. So a lot of things were going to go by the wayside, including the saw. Well, that's fascinating. So now let's uh, take a look at uh, the second stop on our road trip, which is Crandon Park Zoo. Moving from the river to the beach, we find Key Biscayne. Before the barbecues, family gatherings, and loud music from boom boxes, Crandon Park was the host of the Crandon Park Zoo. The zoo moved to another location and was renamed. But before traveling south to what's now Zoo Miami, the Crandon Park Zoo was the place to see exotic animals just a few steps from the beach. The Rickenbacker Causeway connected mainland Dade County to Key Biscayne in 1947. Soon after, Key Biscayne got a new zoo to go with the new bridge. 
Crandon Park Zoo was popular with visitors, especially children. Zoo-goers embraced, sometimes literally, animals such as Dixie the elephant and Cecil and Cecilia the camels. Kids loved the themed playground. Everyone loved the one and a half mile train ride. By the 1960s, more people believed that Crandon Park Zoo's beloved animals needed more spacious quarters than cages. In 1973, Dade voters approved the Decade of Progress measure, which included funding for a new zoo. In 1982, the last animal was moved from Crandon Park Zoo to the new Metro Zoo, now Zoo Miami. Today, the former Crandon Park Zoo is Crandon Gardens. Some of its former cages have been transformed into works of art. Birds such as peacocks strut through the grounds once inhabited by Bengal tigers, tapirs, and gorillas. Fascinating stuff. Uh, what a wonderful um, memory for me. Uh, that was part of my childhood. I'm, Mine too. I'm going to grab this little prop here. And, and Sylvia, could you tell us a little bit about this? This was uh, something you could get when you would go to the yes, zoo. Yes, the, the famous wax figures that uh, you'd put your uh, money, I think it was a dollar back then, uh, into the machine and wait a minute or two while the machine made the wax animal for you. It would slide down. You'd wait another minute or so while it cooled off so you could pick it up and you were always supposed to hold it upside down. And that's Dixie, actually. And Dixie was uh, really an animal a lot of kids had a great affection for. She was brought to the zoo in 1964, sadly died in 1976. And just uh, very warm uh, memories of her and, and more memories of the zoo. Now, you were mentioning, um, I think at, at one point, um, just the, the evolution in zoos and how that meant a difference in the way that people thought about zoos. So the, the changeover to Zoo Miami um, was kind of an evolution. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, uh, people started seeing that putting animals into more of their natural habitat and to having what were called then cageless zoos was better for the animals in the long run than keeping them on display in cages. And the call really started in the 1960s. I think San Diego was one of the first zoos to evolve that way. And it finally happened here in 1982 with the opening of what was then Metro Zoo. Now, I, I think I know for a fact, though, that there are actually some of the animals from the old Crandon Zoo that are still at Zoo Miami and the, mm -hmm. the land tortoises. Um, mm -hmm. well, there are a couple mm -hmm. of them that are still alive. Yes, tor tortoises live very long lives. Uh, some of them can go more than 150 years. So uh, yes, that's, that's a great legacy. Knowing that uh, when uh, the younger members of my family go to the zoo, there's something that's there that I saw as a kid, that they see as a kid, and maybe their kids will see. Fascinating stuff, Sylvia. Uh, well, we're going to continue our discussion, but first, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll travel to the jungle. That's the parrot jungle and the monkey jungle. Don't go away. Three, two. Be focused. Be original. Be a trendsetter. Be an explorer. Be the solution. Be visionary. Be a hero. Be the answer. Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Welcome back. We're moving south to a place where birds rode bikes and flew rockets to the moon. We're talking about the Parrot Jungle. Before it moved to Watson Island and rebranded itself as Jungle Island, Parrot Jungle had an array of feathers, colors, and amazing bird tricks. During the 1930s, Franz Schur, an Austrian immigrant, had a feed store in Homestead. The store included birds that customers could pose for pictures with. Soon, Schur and his wife Louise came up with an attraction where birds could fly free. Parrot Jungle opened on Red Road in 1936 and included shows with birds not only flying, but also riding bicycles and talking. The millions who came to see and be photographed with the birds through the years included Sir Winston Churchill. As popular as Parrot Jungle was, 
because later owners decided more space was needed for events. In 2002, the birds flew the coop to Miami's Watson Island. Today, Jungle Island includes a number of exotic animals in addition to birds. Meanwhile, the village of Pinecrest decided to save the old parrot jungle grounds. Today, Pinecrest Gardens is a municipal park that houses more than a thousand types of native plants, along with birds such as peacocks. So Sylvia was uh, good enough to bring in one of these postcards from Parrot Jungle. And uh, Sylvia, tell us a little bit more about, uh, about the evolution of Parrot Jungle and, and uh, what's happened with it since those early days. Oh, um, it started really uh, quite simply. Uh, again, uh, the introduction mentioned the feed store that the uh, Shurs had. Uh, and then they decided on an attraction. Uh, which was very much beloved. I don't know if there is a child in South Florida who didn't uh, pose slightly squeamishly, including me, uh, with uh, the parrots on uh, the arms and on the head. Right. And uh, the uh, current owners uh, just decided on more areas for uh, banquets and things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, the village of Pinecrest didn't want that kind of expansion there. Uh, so again, uh, the split take, took place with uh, Jungle Island being developed on Watson Island. And uh, it's just great that the village of Pinecrest mm -hmm. took that land and decided to preserve the historic elements, preserve the natural elements as well. So that's the Pinecrest Pine Gardens. Pinecrest Gardens, yes. And, and um, what can people do out there now? Uh, so the original uh, grounds are, are kind of still looking the mm -hmm. same as they did while it was yeah, Parachungle. Yeah, the natural, natural uh, uh, areas are preserved. Uh, there is some wildlife, some uh, birds uh, out there as well. Uh, people can stroll the grounds. There's special events. Uh, I know uh, uh, you talked to earlier about the farmer's market that takes place there That's every right, week. every Sunday. So uh, it really is a wonderful place. It can be rented by people for parties. Uh, and uh, uh, I went to a wedding there, so that's how I discovered that uh, Pinecrest Gardens had been uh, restored and reopened. Fantastic. Going from one jungle to another, the Monkey Jungle opened its doors in 1933 as a wildlife park. Since its opening, this sanctuary is home to more than 500 primates. Monkey Jungle prides itself as the cage for humans, where monkeys run wild. During the 1930s, animal behaviorist Joseph Dumond released six Java monkeys into the natural habitats of South Florida. His studies led to a more ambitious project, the creation of Monkey Jungle in 1935. Located in Homestead, it's the oldest South Florida tourist attraction in continuous operation. Monkey Jungle's motto is where humans are caged and monkeys run wild. For more than 80 years, visitors have had all sorts of up-close personal experiences with monkeys, orangutans, gorillas, and more. The fun has a serious side. Monkey Jungle is one of the few protected habitats for endangered primates in the United States. It's the only one open to the public. The Dumont Conservancy for Primates and Tropical Forests partners with universities and conservation organizations to further the knowledge. Still run by the Dumont family, Monkey Jungle has survived Hurricane Andrew and community growth to continue to thrive. So Sylvia, Monkey Jungle is really special when we uh, think about these roadside attractions in that it's still in existence in the original location where it started out so mm -hmm. long ago. So could you tell me a little bit more on what might attribute to, what we might attribute to that longevity? And people keep, people keep coming. They keep, uh, they head down to Homestead and they keep on visiting. Uh, I think part of it is uh, its family ownership. The Dumont family has kept up that commitment and in fact expanded it uh, even way beyond what Joseph Dumont began in uh, the 1930s. Uh, again, with the conservatory, they have the study of primates as well, the education programs they have for kids. They keep those uh, partnerships with the community and beyond that going. It's not just a place for tourists. And they seem to be, have been a, ahead of the curve in terms of more humane conditions for their animals mm -hmm. and treating them with more respect mm -hmm. and, and, and more consideration. Yeah, I love the motto where the humans are caged and the monkeys run wild. 
Uh, it really does say something about how they, they're not showpieces, the monkeys. They are living beings to be uh, studied and to be protected. Very interesting. I, I remember uh, uh, going on field trips there, and it was just such a fascinating place. Did you did you get I to go there when you were a kid? I have not had a chance to visit Monkey Jungle. And that seems to be one of those places that people still stop at on their mm -hmm. way down south. You know, if they're going to be going down to the Keys or yeah. down to the Everglades, it's right. a, definitely a, a mandatory stop on the way south. Right, and uh, the commitment remains. Uh, I remember seeing um, the the news reports after Hurricane Andrew when they did have a lot of damage there, and they had to rebuild and uh, basically start over again. Uh, and they just have that strong commitment. Well, Sylvia, it's time for another break. But when we come back, we'll be fighting snakes and moving heavy rocks for love. Want to know what it is? Stay tuned and you'll find out. Fresh thinking is being served at Miami-Dade College. Create your own recipe for success in the evolution of food culture at the Miami Culinary Institute. Learn the skills you need to jumpstart your career in the culinary arts. Turn green into gourmet and celery into salary. Miami Culinary Institute. Food, culture, innovation. Visit us at MiamiDadeCulinary.com. Register now. Miami Culinary Institute. Welcome back to Roadside Florida. Before it closed its doors, the Miami Serpentarium was more than a tourist attraction. It was home to a laboratory for venom research. Founded by Bill Host in 1946, the Serpentarium was the first of its kind venom production laboratory in the world. Let's take a bite. I mean, let's take a look. Bill Host was doing serious research into the effects of snake venom on the health of humans. He needed a way to raise money. He came up with the Miami Serpentarium, which opened in 1947. A 35-foot tall cobra greeted visitors to the South Dixie Highway location. Mouths opened as Host and others grabbed poisonous snakes barehanded. Host was bitten numerous times. As he entertained the public, Host worked with local doctors and schools such as the University of Miami on the potential for snake venom treatments. Besides snakes, the Serpentarium also highlighted reptiles, but tragedy struck in 1977 when a six-year-old boy fell into the crocodile pit and was killed. By 1985, Host had decided to close the Serpentarium. For the rest of his life, he continued his research into snake venom. Host lived to be a hundred. Today, Miami Serpentarium Laboratories, located in Punta Gorda, Florida, continues Bill Host's work on snake Snake Venom Research. What a guy, Bill Host. What a Florida original. Yeah. Uh, do you, could you could you give us a little more information about him and, and just his um, story? Very very interested all his life, and and it was a long life, age 100, in how snake venom could be used uh, to help people. And he worked, uh, I mentioned in the segment, uh, with the University of Miami. Uh, in later years, he worked with Dr. Ben Shepard, who was uh, a judge, member of the Dade School Board, and uh, a longtime doctor. He just was extremely passionate about this, even continuing his research after the Serpentarium was closed. He was far more passionate about that than he was about the tourist attraction. Right. He was a reluctant uh, uh, tourist attraction. Uh, tourist operator. attraction, as I recall, it was off of 128th Street and US 1, and mm -hmm. I remember a gigantic cobra, mm -hmm. and uh, the story goes that um, when the cobra uh, was removed after the facility was closed, um, it was actually promised to South Miami High School, mm -hmm. and unfortunately in uh, the process of putting it back on top of the, the building, the cobra collapsed. Ah the original designer of the Cobra built another one for South Miami High School so they could have that as their mascot and their representation of their school. And unfortunately, Hurricane Andrew mm. came by and just tore that one down. So 
Unfortunately, it's a bad pun, but it seems like it was a bit snake bitten. Oh, golly. <laughs> and Andrew really affected a lot of the long standing tourist That's attractions true. that were in South Dade in particular. And uh, a few of them, including Orchid Jungle, uh, for example, closed after, after that. And um, just uh, a long standing effect from that storm. Uh, but the Serpentarium had been long closed by then, too. Right. So, Sylvia, we have one more place to look at. And it's said that love moves mountains. <laughs> but what about a heavy rock? Down in the Redlands, there's a place where one man created a magical place where you can move a nine-ton gate with the touch of your finger. Made completely out of limestone, Coral Castle pays homage to a love that never was and the stones that forever will be. South Florida's most mysterious tourist attraction is probably Coral Castle. Its equally mysterious creator was Edvard Liedskullman, an immigrant from Latvia. According to legend, Ed built Coral Castle as a tribute to a lost love. However, he had a canny eye for promotion for what he called Rock Gate Park. He sculpted more than 1,100 tons of oolitic limestone into unusual shapes and created heavy gates that could open with the touch of a finger. Ed originally built the park in Florida City. During a three-year period, he had all the rocks moved to their current site in Homestead. After Ed's death in 1951, new owners changed the name to Coral Castle. The legend and popularity continued to grow. The tourist attraction even performed a public service after Hurricane Andrew as the undamaged structures hosted military involved in post-storm cleanup. Today, Coral Castle is a beloved icon whose visitors still marvel over its mystique. Sylvia, Ed, another South Florida oh, wow. character t for the ages. Who is Ed? Uh, Ed was indeed a character. And uh, there's the romantic story of Coral Castle, and then there's the uh, practical one, that he came up with something that could help him uh, basically profit <laughs> during uh, when he came to South Dade. He had uh, come from Latvia in the 1910s, first went to the Pacific Northwest where he got used to moving around heavy objects and designing. And he came down here, 1,100 tons of oolitic limestone. Wow. That's quite a project. And he was not a very large person. No, no, five feet, one inch. Uh, but he created uh, items such as the heart table, the romantic heart table, and also my favorite, which is the Florida table, complete mm -hmm. with a bowl-shaped Lake Okeechobee. Uh, as well as tributes to the galaxies, furniture, uh, and uh, other uh, items that people can uh, see at Coral Castle. Well, it's certainly uh, one of those places that a lot of people who live here don't even know exists or know mm -hmm. about, but uh, I'd say it's definitely worth a visit. Absolutely. Uh, just uh, head down to Homestead. Uh, besides the uh, limestone, there's a lot of uh, natural plants to see, and there are also very unusual agama lizards, very large mm -hmm. lizards that just like running around on the limestone. So depending on how you feel about lizards, that could be a, a positive yeah. or, or a minus. Yeah, yeah. They well, won't interrupt the view, though. Well, Sylvia, thank you so much. Thank that you. was just a, a fascinating trip to, or through some of our shared history. And that's all for this edition of Roadside Florida. Roadside Florida features historical film and videos from the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives. To see more from the Wolfson Archives collection, visit our website at wolfsonarchives.org. You can search the archives catalog and watch videos online. And be sure to connect to our YouTube channel, where you will find hundreds of carefully curated clips or link to the Wolfson Archives Facebook page to keep up with our busy calendar of historical happenings. I'm Rene Ramos. Until next time, thank you for watching.